Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's lab uh, of Introduction to Operating System. And in today's lab, we will introduce the P-thread library to design the multi-thread uh, process. So if you have any questions about this lab, you can send an email to this address. And in today's lab, uh, we will introduce how to use the P-thread library to implement some multi-threading programs. So you can see that today we will introduce uh, these functions. The first is uh, that we have some function to create and also exit, and also to wait for another thread to exit. And we also have some function for the mutex or, or to say the critical section. So first we will introduce the thread creations. So with the p library, then we can use the p creates function to create some new threads. So this function will have, four, uh, will have four arguments. The first one is a thread handles. So this one is a pointer, which means that the function will store uh, the return value in this uh, variable. And when you create a new thread, then the library will, will, then the library will assign an ID to these threads and also store the ID in these arguments. So after that, when you want to interact with that, then you can use this ID return uh, using these arguments. And the second one is uh, attribute, which means that you can specify some attributes when you are creating these new threads. So for example, you may want to use another stack size, for example, a larger stack size or some other schedule priority you want to set this thread to have a higher priority so it is scheduled uh, more frequently. Then if you want to modify those attributes, uh, then a default attribute, then you can use the second argument to specify those. But if you do not want to sp specify any attribute, you can also use a null pointer uh, as a second argument, then uh, the library will not uh, we just use the default configuration to create these new threads. And the third argument is the functions. So after you start new threads, you want, to, you want this new thread to execute some functions. So this pointer is just uh, the pointer to the function that you want this new thread to execute. So you can see that this function will take a void pointer as an argument. So you can pass some argument to this uh, function running on the new threads, and you will return another void pointer uh, as the return value. So this can be collected using the pthread join function uh, introduced in the next slides. And here we are using the void pointer because uh, it allows us to pass in any type of argument. We can just have a pointer to some other structures and to some other type of arguments then you can cast the pointer into a void pointer and then use it as, an, as the argument in this, uh, in here. And because this function will accept an argument when it starts, so you need to pass the argument to this function using the false argument uh, here, which is also a void pointer. So uh, like other functions in the, in the library, uh, it will return zero if the thread is successfully created. Otherwise, it will return a non-zero non error code, representing the cause of error. And after you create a thread, you can also exit from a thread by calling this p thread exit functions. So it will take a, a void pointer arguments, and you can see in the previous slides. So this star routine will return the void pointer as a uh, the return value. So if you also want to uh, exit from the thread immediately and then return the value immediately, then you can call this p thread exit functions with the return value here, and then it will be passed to the thread that is waiting for it to exit. And if you do not call this function and just let the star routine function return, then it will also be the same uh, like calling the p thread exit. But if you just return from the function, then the p library internally, it will call the exit function for you. So you do not need to worry about that. And if you want to uh, have a one thread to wait for another thread to exit, so you can collect the return value 
uh, from there to adds, then you can use the join functions. So the join function, we have two arguments. So because you want to wait for another thread to exit, so you need to specify the thread ID uh, using this first argument. So when you create the threads, you will return the ID, then you can use it here to refer to that thread. And then you can uh, call the function with the ID to wait for that thread to exit. And also when a thread exits, it will return a void pointer as a re return uh, as the return value. And if you want to collect that return value, then you can pass a second argument. So here we are using a pointer to a void pointer because uh, the join function will store that void pointer return value in this argument. So it must be another pointer so you can change the value from inside the function. And uh, if you want to pass some data from the trial thread to the calling thread, when the thread exits, then we have two we have two implementations, and the second one is, is a wrong implementation. So you can see that in this function, which will be executed by the new threads, uh, you will first cast the argument pointer back to the thread data t. So this is the real type we store the input argument. But here, because we first cast it into the void pointer and then pass it into the function, so the first thing we do in the function is that we want to cast it back to the real type. So we can extract those value from the, uh, the data structure. And inside the data, we have two numbers and we want to calculate the, val the sum of the two numbers and then return the sum as, a, as the return value to the, to the parent threads. So here you can see that first we just print the two numbers A and B, and then we just use a addition to calculate the sum of these two numbers and store it in a local variable, the red wall here. And then we just simply return the address of red wall uh, and cast it to a void pointer to match the type. So this implementation is wrong because uh, here we are storing the return value in a local variable and then return the, the address to the local variable to the outside. But when this function return, then all the local variable will be released and the, also the stack where the local variable uh, resides on will be, will, be also, uh, will also be released. So if you try to use the, the address to this local variable after you return the function, return from the function, then their address will already contain, will be already be released. So some uh, the program can reuse that space to store some other value, and it may overwrite the return value you, you store in that locations. So uh, you cannot use a local variable to pass the return value back to the parent uh, functions. Instead, you can use the malloc. So. Uh, similar to this wrong implementation, first we uh, cast the argument back to the data type and then extract the two numbers from this data and calculate the sum. But instead of storing the, the sum in a local variable, we first allocate the space to store an integer using the malloc function and then get its address uh, and store it in the, in, in the return pointer. And then we will just store the sum of these two number in this location uh, allocated by this malloc. So the memory allocated by the malloc function will not be released until you call the free function and with that locations. So this, uh, the space allocated in this line will, uh, will continue to be valid even if you return from these functions. So if you store the sum of these two numbers in that location, then it will also be valid after you return from this function and the parent uh, function and the parent thread call the join function to wait for it. Then you can collect this location and also get the return value. But you should also be careful that after you uh, use that return value, you, so you should also call the free function with the return pointer uh, to release the space you allocate here. Otherwise, you, you have some uh, memory leak. And after we can create the threads, we, want, we also want to synchronize those threads. So here 
the first is that we can use the log to perform a synchronization. And the log here must be properly in, initialized before you uh, use it. So the log is actually the critical section and at each time and at each moment only one uh, thread is allowed to run inside the critical section. So in this case, we in this way we can synchronize between multiple threads. And there are two ways to initialize a log variable. The first one is we, we can use the constant uh, to do this. We just assign this p thread mutex initializer constant to a log variable that we want to use. And then you can initialize this log variable to a default state. And then you can begin to use it. Another way is that we can use the dynamic way and using the p thread mutex init function. So this function takes two arguments. The first one is the log variable that we want to initialize. And the second argument is a null pointer here. So actually the second point, the second argument is a pointer to, a, to an attribute structure. So if you want to uh, create a mutex with some attributes, for example, whether it can be recursively logged, then you can specify those configuration using the second argument and also an attribute structure. But if you just want to initialize the mutex and log variable based on the default configuration provided by the library, then you can just pass a null pointer as the second argument and the library will, will initialize it for you. So the difference between these two is that in a second way, you can use the attribute pointer, uh, the attribute pointer to specify some other attribute about a log. Whereas the first, uh, the first method we just initialize the log, the log variable to the default state. But if you are using a dynamic way, you should also check the return value here. So if the PC library can successfully initialize the mutex based on the attribute you provided here, then it will return zero, which means that uh, the initialization the initialization is success. But if the return value is a non-zero numbers, then it will represent some error that uh, cause the library to uh, not be able to initialize your log variable. And then you can, based on the return value, you can perform some error handle. So the log variable will, and the mutex will just provide the mutual exclusion to a critical section, which means that Inside the critical section, only one thread can execute a call at a time, and you do not need to worry about the other uh, interference with uh, other threads. So the interface for this mutual exclusion is two functions. The first is the lock, and then we have an unlock. So both of them, we just take the, the lock variable that we initialize as the argument. So this code shows the usage for the mutex. And you can see here, before we use a lock, we must initialize the lock. And here we are just using the static way and assigning the constant to the lock variable to initialize it. After we, after we initialize the lock variable, then we can use the lock uh, function to lock the mutex. So after this function success, then we can continue into the critical section. So when you call the lock function, if there are other thread is currently inside the critical section, which means that it successfully locked the mutex before the current threads, then the current thread calling the lock function will wait until that lock exit from the critical section using the unlock function. So in this way, you can guarantee that only one thread will execute the code here, which increment x by one. So you do not need to worry about that multi-thread multiple thread will modify the value of x here so you will have some conflict using a lock then you can guarantee that only one thread can execute the code here uh, to avoid the interference between different threads and after you modify the variable and you can leave the critical section then you can call the unlock function on this lock variable to unlock it so after you unlock a mutex if there are some other thread waiting for the lock then they will be uh, allowed to continue and also enter the critical section one by one. 
and finish the operations. And also the log function will have a return code. And if the return code is zero, that means the mutex has been logged successfully. But if the return code is non-zero, then uh, it is a number that represents the, the cause of error that why the library cannot log the mutex for you. So every time you call a log function, you should check whether the return code is zero. Otherwise, there may be some, some cases you return a, a non-zero value with failure, but if you do not check it, then you may enter the critical section accidentally. So here we can also provide a wrapper function uh, showing it here. So you can just, uh, instead of calling the mutex log and checking the return value, you can just, just write a, a wrapper function and call this wrapper function. And in that case, you can use the assert function to make sure that the program will only continue if the return code is zero and also a log is successfully uh, acquired. Otherwise, it will just uh, abort the current threads. So in this way, you can uh, make your code cleaner, but you can also check for the failure when uh, locking a new text. So beside the log function, we can also have some non blocking log. So you can see here, the log function will, is actually a blocking function which means that if there are some other threat currently inside the critical section, then this function will not return immediately because otherwise you will have multiple threats entering the critical section at a time. So uh, the log function will not return immediately in that case, and the threat will be blocked by the operating system until the other threat called the unlock function and allow you to to enter the critical section. So this is the blocking function. But the problem with the blocking function is that uh, you may be blocked in that function for a very long time. But in some cases, you do not want, want that. You will just, uh, you, you want to use a non-blocking lock to lock the mutex. So the non-blocking lock here has two interfaces. The first one is the try lock functions. So the try lock will just try to lock the mutex without waiting for it. So if there are some other threat currently inside the critical section, then it will not wait for it to finish. It will just return an error code to indicate that the lock cannot be acquired at this moment. And the second function is a timed lock, which means that you can specify a time out and then lock the mutex. So if the library cannot acquire the mutex within the timeout here, you specify, then it will also return an error code to indicate that uh, it cannot uh, acquire the lock at this moment. So the usage for the first function, the try lock function is that uh, you also initialize the lock variable using the constant here, and then you call the try lock on this lock. So there will be two cases. The first case is, is that there are some other threat currently inside the critical section. So this try lock cannot, uh, cannot, can, can, cannot continue, but you do not need one, want it to block. So it will return an EBZ e return code. You can just match the return code with EBZ. So if the return code is EBZ, then it means that it failed to get a lock due to the resource busy and the mutex is uh, locked by another threat. So in this case, uh, you can perform some error handling uh, for the log. Otherwise, if the return code is zero, that means uh, the try log function successfully locked the mutex, and then you will enter the critical section, and you can modify the shared variable x here, or whatever your critical section is. And also, when you leave the critical section, you also need to call the unlock function to release the log. So the other thread can enter the critical section here. And the second function is the time lock. So the time lock here uh, will also accept a mutex as an argument and you will, add, you will accept a, an addition timeout argument, a specified timeout. For example, you can set a timeout to be 10 seconds from now. Then this function will only try to wait for another thread to, to, uh, to complete within this timeout. So if you, if this function uh, cannot 
acquire the mutex within this time of the specify here, then it will return an error code, just, just showing this code here. So first, we also initialize the log variable using the constant. Then we call the time log function on this log variable. And this with a timeout argument. So the timeout argument is uh is omitted here, but you can specify a timeout uh like for for uh the next 10 seconds and also next nine minutes. Then the function will try to acquire the mutex uh for the timeout we specify here. So if after the timeout it still cannot acquire the mutex because some other thread is inside the critical section then it will return an e times out error code to indicate this fail situation. Then you can perform some error handling for this case. Otherwise, if the return code is zero, then it means that the time lock has successfully uh, acquired a lock within the time out. Then you will have entered the critical section and you can modify some shared variable here and also unlock the lock variable after you finish to let the other a threat to enter the critical section. So that's all for this lab.